as the speaker today um, is someone who has a strong involvement now, um, fortunately, with Villanova University. She, um, the social justice documentary film that was done last semester was about uh, Dorothy and about the, uh, about the organization that she started, Mothers in Charge. So this book um, was my first, really, uh, or my second sort of introduction to the organization. And I find it, um, it helped us understand uh, the issues and it helped all the students, some of whom are here, who made this film No Greater Pain, uh, understand something about uh, Mothers in Charge and about uh, the way these women have come together certainly to be, um, to be a support group for women who have lost children to violence but also to be a peace advocacy group. And so um, the Center for Peace and Justice here uh, you know, said, knew that it was important for, to have uh, important speakers like this to come here and to tell us their stories and to, um, to let us understand a little bit more about the issues involved in losing loved ones to violence. So please welcome today's speaker, who will tell you about this wonderful book that's available, uh, Dorothy Johnson Spade. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everyone? Good. Um, I'm starting to feel like know it's part of my home. Like I'm, I've been here several times in the last few months with working with the, uh, the students from the Social Justice Center. Um, it's feeling good being here and I'm thanking you all for the invitation today. Uh, mothers in Charge, as you heard, is a group of mothers, grandmothers, aunts and sisters, most of whom have lost a son, a daughter, or loved one to violence. And I have a few of the moms here. I'm going to introduce them to you in a few. But I want to tell you a little bit about how we started with the book. This is a book that they have for sale on the back, and it's called Mothers in Charge, Faces of Courage. After the murder of their children, these women began a campaign for peace in the city of brotherly love. That's Philadelphia. And we published this book with um, limited resources back in 2009, so it's about two years, maybe two years in May. We um, raised the money to publish this. And it's a beautiful book. It's, um, actually talks about the stories of 26 of the mothers in our organization and tells their story, that's Ruth there, tells their story of loss, um, the murder of their children, but more importantly, I think it shares courage. It shares um, resilience. It shares many of the qualities, the special qualities that these women possess. How they've been able to take a very tragic loss and turn it to something very powerful. Um, Mothers in Charge was started in May of 2003 after the death of my son, Khalik. He was 24 years old, graduated from the University of Maryland, uh, was going back to get his master's degree. And um, in November, of 2001, he decided he wanted to move in with his brother, uh, my stepson. And next door to where Shamp lived was a very angry, out of control person. And about a week or two after Khalid moved in, his friends were visiting him at the house and um, they were all driving up in their new cars and because they're all college grads and they were just having fun. Next door to where his brother lived, was a very angry, out of control person. And I usually I bring that, and I do have it in the car roof. I usually bring his criminal history record. He was 26 years old and very, very angry. Had a long criminal history um, record that started at the age of 16. And he argued with my son about his friends pulling up and parking there. And his argument was that the young lady that lived there with him, his baby's mother, um, couldn't get the stroller out of the house and down the curb because the cars are parked on the curb. But this is what everybody did on American Street. This is a very teeny street. 
So a couple days after the argument, and the argument actually started with one of my son's friends, and my son intervened as he always would do, because he was like a peaceful kind of a guy. And he intervened with um, this friend and this gentleman, this guy who you know, ended up killing him uh, about this parking space. So a couple days later, my son was coming back home after dropping off a girlfriend. And it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. And he parked the car in the back of the house because he, of course, didn't want any more problems. He parked the car in the back. Um, and came around front. But Ernest Odom still holding on to all of the anger that he felt as a result of, I think, um, being embarrassed or just, as the young kids call, hating because all these guys are nice cars and nice, you know, out of wear and, you know, maybe he's feeling challenged by his girlfriend being there and the young guys are coming up. Still holding on to all of that anger, he decided to shoot and kill my son that night. So on December 6th, my son was shot seven times by Ernest Odom over this parking situation. Um, on the news, a month after, so now it's January 2002, I'm watching the six, 11 o'clock news. And there's a segment maybe you all have seen called Crime Stoppers. And on Crime Stoppers, there's a woman who's asking for help. You know, there's a murder and they want information, so this segment, she's asking for help. Someone to come forward with information on the person who killed her son in July of 2001, which is five months before my son was murdered. And I sat there and I watched this woman give what little information she had about her son's murder. Her son's name, name was Justin, he was 19 years old give little information that she had. And somehow, while I'm sitting there watching it with such pain in my heart because it's only been a month since, Mer since Kali was murdered, I felt a real connection to her. And um, they didn't know much about the person who had stabbed Justin to death on the porch in July 2001. But there's something that she said and things that I felt with her. I thought a connection. We knew, she knew that the person who killed Justin had a pit bull that he was looking for that night. I knew that the person who killed Kali five months earlier, raised pit bulls. And I felt a real strong connection. So I went to the house where I saw her standing on the porch in that news segment. And I rang the bell and I asked the gentleman if he would, um, if he knew the woman who had been in the news report that prior, a couple days prior to that. And could I see her, or would I be able to speak with her? And he said, she lives around the corner, but I'll call her. And he called around the corner to Ruth Donnelly and um, told her that someone was there with information on the person who killed her son. This is Ruth. Can you come up here? <laughs> this is Ruth Donnelly, who is one of the founding members of Mothers in Charge, who I always say we've been joined at the hip since December, January, oh, January of 2002. Because unfortunately, tragically, both our children were killed by the same person. We went through the trial together, um, my trial being first. Mm -hmm. The person responsible was found guilty of first degree murder, and then her trial, which first ended in a hung jury, but later, about how many months later? Another year later. Another year later, they went back to trial, and Ernest was found guilty, Ernest Odom was found guilty of Justin's murder as well. So he's now currently serving two life sentences. I just ask Ruth to say a few words. Um, I guess I just want to say I am always so grateful that day that Dorothy came to my house. Um, if it wasn't for her encouragement and push that um, Mothers in Charge was a big part of my life, you know, getting involved with Mothers in Charge and starting Mothers in Charge was a big part of my life. Um, I think our sons every day look down at us and just go, yay, mom, and that gives me the strength a lot of times. Um, and then when I was talking to Dorothy and doing, and we were talking, there was so many things in common that our sons had um, even though they only lived a couple blocks and they never really met each other. And I think that also brought, you know, has brought us close, closer together because we had so many things in common. But um, I want to thank you guys for putting this documentary together. It's been a wonderful project. And uh, I don't know what I... <laughs> Dorothy's <laughs> pretty much covered our whole entire story. And that was... In fact, it will be 10 years already this uh, July. Um, and... Uh, I, I really don't believe I would have made it far, this far without her help. <laughs> and um, 
What we're here today to talk about is overcoming tragedy, and we're going to share a little bit about that, but I also want to introduce the other two members of Mothers in Charge that are here. Unfortunately, the organization has grown. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we've helped uh, maybe five, six, seven hundred women who've come through our doors over the last eight years. And we have a core group of a few hundred mothers who are part of our organization, and we have a chapter in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and also in Brooklyn, New York, and you know, it's, it's not just a Philadelphia problem. Unfortunately, it's a problem that affects this country. And we are, again, thankful to Villanova for being a part of this uh, solution to make a difference with this issue. I'm going to ask um, Marvella just to come up and tell who she is. Marvella is a friend and also a member of Mothers in Charge, someone that, um, believe it or not, we went to school together um, in, what, ninth grade, eighth grade, and high school as well, and never thought that our lives would end up being brought together in this way, but she's also a founding member of Mothers in Charge. Hello. I came to Mothers in Charge after, you know, losing my son, Eric. He was 21, a third year um, engineers, um, architect engineer student, a black belt, and a teacher in karate. And he was just doing all the right things in his life. And um, one evening, as he and his father, you know, they was just sitting around, a fight broke out between two women, and they went to break up this fight. And as they was breaking up this fight, the woman's husband took an ice pick and was stabbing my husband in the back with this ice pick. And as my son looked over, seeing his father getting stabbed, pushed him out the way, the man just turned, you know, he just looked up, the man just turned, and stabbed him once in his heart. And he was born on January 3rd, 1996. So it's been 15 years now, and it's really been, you know, really hard, but coming to Mothers in Charge and coming to Compassionate Friends, it has this really eased, you know, like the burden and the pain of being around others that also lost loved ones. And last but not least, I'd like to um, ask Donna Giddings, who is a relatively new mom, um, been around for five, six years, six years now. And we have some mothers who are only with us, and you'll see in the video maybe Burnett and some of the other mothers who are new two, three years. But we continue to support families <coughs> who've had um, this tragic loss. But more importantly, we give them the strength to go on. And the goal, of course, is to make a difference not just to lay down and die because of the tragedy that you've experienced, but how do you get up and make a difference? That's the real uh, work of Mothers in Charge, just to give them the strength they need so they can go on, but also to make a difference. So Donna Giddings, would you come and say a few words? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Donna Giddings, and correction, this may will be five years I've been with the organization. Um, six years since my family has been gone. February the 18th, 2005, my mother, my son, and my son's best friend was murdered in my mother's home in North Philadelphia. Um, that was a normal day for me, came home after a long day of work to be in a normal day, talking to my mother, telling her I love her, you know, as we always did, talking to my son, scolding him about not coming home, you know, being in the street, you know, as a mother would do. And I went and I took my daughter. I have it. At that time, my daughter was 12 and I took her with me that day. I started to leave her, but something just would not let me leave her on that day. I um, took her with me and we went to get our hair done. I even offered my mom to come with us, but to no avail, she said, no, not today. So, spoke to my son and I, I gave him this warning. I said, Andre, he was brushing his hair. And I always can remember this and it, I always had flashbacks of him brushing his hair in the mirror that day. Um, that evening about 6.15. Stop trusting everybody. Everybody is not your friend. A lot of times we've heard our parents say that about a particular person that they may see us hanging with. And I just felt this when he said this person's name. For some reason, I had never met the kid, but I just did not feel good about this kid. And um, I left. And I took my daughter with me. And we stayed uh, at the hair salon for a few hours upon coming back home. My life was totally changed. Today, I am a changed woman, can I say, partly for the good, and it has been a rough journey. I'm still processing a lot of 
what's going, what has transpired through my life. But um, the death of my son and my mother took me to a place that I thought I was not going to be able to return from. But connecting with this organization is all is a, such a story, and I don't know, I don't have the time to tell how I met Dorothy before, prior to even experiencing the death of my family, there was a big unity day and I saw her and I saw the mothers and they marched and I thought they were wonderful. And all I could do was look at her and say, wow. And she had this really nice haircut and the color was popping, the sun was shining. And that's all I could say about the organization at that time because I hadn't experienced the death, the death of my mother and my son yet. So in that, uh, a year later, I would need the organization. And this organization has done something for me. I'm a very spiritual person. I know that God has brought me this far, but he puts people in our lives for reasons that we will never, ever understand, like meeting her prior to meeting the organization later. And it has been a blessing, it has been strength to me, and to have other mothers that can understand what we go through. When we have the sleepless, sleepless nights that can say, you know what, you're going to make it through this moment. It's just this time you have to go through this. And, and we have strength for one another. And that's what I found within the organization, strength. I found love. I found kindness. I found understanding here. And it has brought me to this point where I feel like I can live again. And I'm just thankful for Dorothy. Really, I am. It's been a blessing. Okay, I always say that I've met some of the most courageous women in my life that I wish I could have, could have met under different circumstances. Um, I think the goal here today is to get you to understand that in the face of adversity and challenges in your life, that you can make it. You can go on. You need support systems in place. I truly believe you have to have faith. I don't know how anyone yes. could get through the death of a child without having faith in God or some higher power because it is the worst tragedy, the worst pain in your life. It's not even the natural order of things, I don't believe. You know, children expect to bury their parents. Parents don't expect to bury their children. But yet, this continues to happen throughout this country. And I think that every opportunity I get, I ask somebody to get involved to make a difference. And that can be done on so many levels. You know, whether you're mentoring a young child who may be at risk you know, whether you're teaching him to read, whether you're becoming a mentor, whatever you're doing, maybe in your own family or in a community, you know, you make a difference. Um, tragedy is no stranger um, to me. Um, and that's why I always say that with faith and determination and belief and a resilience that you have to find within yourself that you can overcome any tragedy. And everybody has a story. This is our story, and tragic stories, I, I must admit. But everybody has a story. You know, maybe each and every one of you have experienced something that was difficult for you to do, to get through, to deal with in your own lives. Um, tragedy was very, sort of very early for me. I mean, at the age of 15, I lost both my parents in high school, six months apart, my mom and then my dad. Um, the next, I think, most horrible thing that I had to experience the first time was the death of my three-year-old daughter, Carlina, who died of bacterial meningitis at the age of three. That was in 1986. And I thought then, oh, it's no way I'm going to survive this. It is no way I'm going to be able to pick up myself and get through this tragedy. And I was angry. I felt so many different kinds of emotions as a result of her loss. Like, what kind of God is this that would take a two-year-old baby? I mean, I dealt with those kinds of emotions. I dealt with so many feelings and so many emotions. It was such a journey. And my prayer every night was, okay, let me get through this. Uh, and I did. But who would have thought 15 years almost to the same day that my son would be shot and killed? And I always say, we don't know why things happen in our lives. We truly don't understand them. And maybe one day they will be clear. I have no idea, you know, how I, why I would lose two children. You know, I have an adopted daughter now who looks almost like me, walks like me, talks like yes. me and everything. Yes. But my two biological children, I lost. And believe me, there were days that I was going out this world backwards as a result of that, you know, because the pain was that bad. But today, um, I'm standing. 
you know, committed to making a difference in this community, um, working every day with mothers um, who've lost and families and young people who need support and guidance and direction so that they don't grow up to be an Ernest Odom with the anger and the pain that he obviously had in his life that would make allow him to take two promising young men. So I'm working along with the women of this organization to make a difference. And I think that is a part of my healing. So oftentimes, if you're feeling like you're going through something and there's no way out, sometimes after you pray and have faith and believe that you can come through it, if you reach back and grab someone else and bring them along, it helps you to begin to heal. It helps them, but it also helps you. And I think that has kind of been the saving grace for all of us in this organization. Because when Donna came, I thought, oh my God, how do you help someone who's lost her future and her present? She lost her son, who was her future, and her mom, you know, a double funeral. How do you help someone who's got to go through life like that, with that kind of tragedy, living every day? And as I see her today, committed to working to make a difference in the lives of others, you know, but it's that part of her that wanted to heal, wanted to take that pain, that tragedy, and turn it into something positive that I think has allowed her to be able to stand today. And as I said, we all have challenges. You know, I sometimes just refer to it now as life. You know, it's life. And some of you are too young to maybe understand it, and then maybe not. You know, because we work with some young kids today who are eight, nine years old and have had some stories that they can tell, just because a lot of times adults have let them down in their lives and different things have happened to some of the young people that we work with in the different schools. Even at eight and nine, you wonder, hmm, you know, why has life dealt this young kid such a terrible blow? You know, since he's starting life with such tragedy already, you know, loss of parents, family member, mother incarcerated, dad, whatever, whatever the circumstances. We, as I say, we don't know. We truly don't know why things happen, but it is life. And somehow you have to take the lemons and make lemonade. And that's not easy, believe me. I'm saying it like, you know, very lightly, but it's not something that's easily done. But it's something that we all can do, you know. We just have to find a way to do that and get the support, whatever it is in your life that you're going through, whatever it is. And it, I'm sure whatever you're going through at the moment seems tragic to you. Or maybe you have friends or family that are going through something and you don't understand and know how they're going to get through it. But encourage them. Find support for them. And help them to heal. Give back or pay forward. You know, that's how you got to go through life. And I believe that's how I'm still standing today because I believe in that with all my heart. That you give and you pay forward. That's the rent for the space you occupy here on earth. It's not just always about you. You've got to give back and make a difference. And in doing so, you grow as a person. You, you develop, you know, giving and sharing and being a part of helping someone else in life is key to living life. I'm going to stop for a minute and see if there's any questions, any comments, any thoughts. I'd really like to hear from the young people. Um, if, if you've experienced anything that uh, has been tragic and you found a way to get through it or, or not, or if there's some way that you can think of to address the issue that we fight with every day around the issue of violence, if there's some way that you can think of to contribute something to make a difference, I just want to again commend the students here at Villanova for this very powerful documentary. It is so powerful in terms of not even so much of the content of the video, but the power is in the work of the students, that they gave up their time and made a commitment to make a difference. That is so powerful. They followed us around for <laughs> uh, weeks, you know, in our homes in our meetings all across Philadelphia, wherever we were, they were there. But they were there with sensitivity and caring and concern. 
And I think that's what comes across in this video more than anything, because they had the footage and they had to, what they received and what they got with the visits and the, and, and the, the meetings and things that they attended, they had to take all of that, which at times I'm sure was very painful for them, because it's painful to hear our stories. I know that. I understand. I get that. But it's important. And they realized the importance of what they were doing. And I think they put so much into it. And that's what truly, truly comes through in this documentary. So I'd like to maybe even hear from some of them to talk. And I know we're here to talk about the book. This is the book. But the book is us. The documentary is us. This book is very powerful. I suggest that you pick it up, get it for a friend, maybe who's going through something. It's not so much the fact that these are mothers who've lost their children, but it's the courage of the women in order to survive the loss that is most important on these pages. That they were able to, in spite of the pain of a loss, they're in spite of that, they're able to get up every day and make a difference in someone's life. That they've been able to take the pain of the loss and make a difference. This is a chapter later in New York, Reese Snapper. This is Kathleen O'Hara. Her son was killed at uh, Catholic College in Francisco College in Ohio. She's one of our members and has wrote a very beautiful book called A Grief Like No Other. These are the mothers who, in spite of their pain, Doris works in our office. Her 18-year-old daughter was killed leaving a party, graduation party. She was actually, she buried her daughter in her prom dress. I mean, she didn't expect to have to bury her daughter 18 years old. She just graduated, was attending a graduation party, and somebody out of control shot into a crowd and killed her daughter. This is my niece and my sister-in-law. Lisa was dating a young man who was totally out of control, also, and angry. And she wanted to break up with him. This is a, a case of domestic violence. He shot her. She was eight months pregnant. Her mother had to bury her and her unborn baby. Domestic violence. So while these are sad stories, again, it's about the courage of these women who get up every day to make a difference in the life of other folks. So again, Find a way, no matter what it is you're going through, to get connected to support, or better still, to reach back and help someone else, because you get support that way as well. But make a difference in your life. Don't just, even, even at, at a young age, a college student, don't just take life for granted. You know, make a difference in somebody else's life, and I guarantee you, you will be richly rewarded for it. So questions or comments, thoughts? Yes? Um, my question is, how did you not proclaim God? How did you not give up in Him? Um, I think initially I did with my daughter. Um, and was probably angry even after colleagues murder. But initially I think the, the, the major loss, the first loss with Carlina, I couldn't understand that. I just truly couldn't under innocent baby, you know, who contracted bacterial meningitis in the form that it was so deadly that it took her life so suddenly. Um, meningitis meningococcus was the bacterial strand that they say is very seldom a cure for that. Don't know how she got it. You know, the doctors say, well, somebody could have coughed on her in the supermarket or, you know, it's, it's transferred airborne. So I couldn't understand, I could not understand that. Innocent, you know, so I was very angry at God. I remember a particular day, a friend of mine who was very spiritual, very religious, you know, called me. And she would call me, you know, on, on regular occasions to have a word of prayer. And I like laying the phone down, like, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear nothing about prayer, pray with somebody else. I'm not feeling that. I don't even want to hold the phone and listen to what she's saying. That's how angry I was. Because why should I be praying or hearing you pray? because my prayer every night was to keep my kids safe, to keep my baby safe. So I felt like God, my prayer hadn't gone any further than the ceiling because Carlene is dead. 
But you work through that anger and you work through that pain. And you get to a place where you don't understand it still, but you learn that you gotta live with it. So the anger with God, I had plenty of it. I was angry with him for a while. But my faith is my foundation. That's my basis for you know everything that I was ever taught growing up. So eventually I went back to that and believed that I could make it and didn't understand why it had happened, but that would be okay with God. Hope I answered your question. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? Just a, just a plug for the film. Um, next Tuesday at 11.45, a week from today at 11.45 in the cinema in the morning, we're going to show it. Um, and Dorothy and the mothers will, uh, from Mothers in Charge will be in the film. Uh, so we'll show it at 11.45 to about 12.15. It's about a 30-minute film, 30, 31 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a little discussion afterwards. And then we'll probably show it again in the evening uh, in April uh, on a Monday night, I believe. We're going to show it uh, Monday or Tuesday night. So it'll be a couple more times to see it. We've screened it here already. It's a great film. Some of the students here. So I can turn it over to one of you if you want. Has anyone seen the film that's here? Other than, of course, the student? No. Okay. You can show a few minutes of it. Why not? Just to show a little teaser of the film, uh, just if you want to watch it. Tell your friends. All right, then. became accustomed to loss at an early age when both her parents passed during her sophomore year of high school. In 1986, her three-year-old daughter, Carlina, died from bacterial meningitis. A lot of anger, a lot of emotions that I never processed as a result of the pain of the loss, I think, interfered with my life. This is the home that I raised my children in. The basketball courts are where Kali lived, where he spent so many hours. He loved playing basketball. I love the fact that both my kids, Marquita and Kali, grew up here, and they love this neighborhood. I remember it was about this time of year, and my son started talking to me about moving in with his brother. And I thought, it's a nice neighborhood, you'll be okay. You know, your son leaves home for the first time, you're gonna be concerned, you're gonna be worried. He's moving on American Street. What could possibly happen on American Street? My son had a confrontation about a parking space with the neighbor who lived right next door. The person who lived here at 1622, Ernest Odom Jr., had no car, no job, nothing going on in his life. There were so many domestic violence calls to this address because of the violence of this man. But he had a record on our lawn of all kinds of charges. Assault, civil assault, robbery, everything. But nothing had been done. Ernest Odom came out of this house at 622 and shot my son seven times. And he later died right here under this light on American Street on December 6, 2001. Sensibly over a parking space 
Has Ernest Otis stood up? So that's it. So tell your friends. It's a great film, and it's at uh, 11. We'll open the doors at 11:30 next Tuesday from today. I'm sure you'll more, but I'm going to give it all. Away. As I said, it's a very powerful film, and again, I want to thank Villanova for all that they did to make it possible. I met Steve and John at another screening for a movie they had did. Um, I guess about a year or so ago. Uh, two, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was 2009. Yeah. Oh, two years ago. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I talked to them about our organization and, and could they do a documentary on us. And, um, you know, after a few meetings with Steve, it, it happened. And also, as well as this book talk today, came about as a result of Steve's work and um, supporting this organization. So, again, I want to thank Villanova for all of their help and their support and helping us to make a difference in the lives of many people. This film hopefully will be seen across this country and will touch folks in a way that they get moved to want to do something. And that's the real goal. You know, what can you do to make a difference in someone's life? And how that affects your life in, in the process. That's the key. That's so very, very important. And I, just quickly, I wanted to share a quick story. I know that the lives of the Villanova students that, that took part in it, 15 of them, uh, their lives were changed because they shared that with us at our screening. But um, one mother in particular came up to us after the first screening and said that her daughter's life had been changed by her participation in producing this film. You know, um, she didn't take life so for granted anymore. And some of the students said that this was one of the best classes that they've ever had and most meaningful because, again, they saw something that they were not familiar with, the faces of mothers who experienced a tragedy. And through their work, again, they were able to truly make a difference in our lives because they did each time we met with them. Um, they showed us such support and love that that helped, but also to produce, again, this powerful documentary. On Tuesday, May 10th, we're going to show this film in Philadelphia. And I'd like to invite all of you out. We're hoping that Villanova will be our special guest, you know, at our eighth anniversary celebration. It will be on Penn's Landing, at Penn's Landing Cato. So I'm going to leave these around and get them out. Hopefully you mark your calendar on Tuesday, and that's the Tuesday after Mother's Day. We'll be celebrating our eighth anniversary, and we'll have an opportunity to show this powerful film to Philadelphia. And we'd like Villanova to be in the house as well. So, are there any other questions? Yes. Um, first of all, I just want to commend you women for doing this. It's just such a positive action. Um, and to looking at his uh, charges, how did he have a gun? How did he have a gun legally? So glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's he, of course, couldn't have purchased the gun himself because he had, as you mentioned, a criminal history. But the girlfriend, her testimony in trial was that she purchased the gun and gave it to him. And after she purchased it, she never saw it again. He just constantly wore it in his, um, in his belt. Um, that's another thing that we do, and maybe that's something at some point can be an initiative here. We've worked a lot around illegal guns, um, straw purchasers, people who go into gun stores and buy guns for people who ordinarily couldn't have purchased them themselves, either with a criminal history or a mental health record. You know, and all that is supposed to um, be checked thoroughly. Um, but because people go in, gun, go in stores and purchase guns and give them to people, teenagers, drug dealers, people with mental health issues, that's why we see so much of the violence that we see. And even today as we speak, there's actually a rally going on um, at a gun store in Northeast Philadelphia. We would have been there had we not been here. But there's a rally to um, look at how gun owners do business. They don't do the legal checks. They don't do the things that they're supposed to do. Coliseum was closed a few years ago because it sold more guns, illegal guns, in Philadelphia than any other gun store dealer. And through um, Ceasefire PA and different other organizations that organized to address the issue of gun violence and store purchase and things like that, they were able to shut that store down. So um, writing legislators and, and getting involved, and even in that initiative, makes a difference and addresses the issue of violence in our communities. And I always say no one's safe until we're all safe. 
You know, we all have to be involved. As you may think, well, I don't know anyone who was murdered, or I, you know, but we all need to be working for, the, for peace in, in communities across this country. Any other questions? What do you think? Me? I'm, I'm coming to you. <laughs> but I'm talking, I'm coming, you're next. So what do you think? No, this is great. I, you know, I've talked to these guys about well, he's been trying to get me into the, into the documentary class for a couple of years, but this is fantastic. I mean, you guys do great work, but I think it's especially, like you said, it's especially great that, that they've been able to actually put it in a format that it can do way more good and way more outreach than you alone. Absolutely. Do. And Absolutely. that's the power of that. And that's the goal, you know, to connect with other folks so that it becomes almost contagious across this country where we can't do it all. We need everybody you know, working on some level to make a difference. Uh, I just want to commend you ladies, first and foremost. Um, my brother actually goes to Temple um, University in Philadelphia, so uh, he's been jumped twice, welcome down to be more. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, had those people had a gun, I'm sure he would have been in the same position. So I want to thank you guys for pursuing your mission, and I hope you guys are making steps in your direction. Okay. And think of some way you can help us. Well, okay. Ladies. Um, well, I remember one of the talk, uh, talk backs for the premiere, I think it was, um, talked about how on the way to the shoot from one class, we were excited about how we were going to tell the story and how we were going to get and then just talk about it, um, and being excited to tell the story, but on the way back, they would be like silent, mm -hmm. and we'd all be absorbing the story and reflecting on it, um, but this experience helped me further with me. Thank you. Yeah, Julia. Um, again, just thank you for being so open with us and sharing with us. Um, I was definitely changed by this experience. Um, you know, murder and violence were something I had never experienced in my own life. Um, but, I mean, your courage is just inspiring. And it's just it's changed my whole perspective. I can't watch the things the same and I can see this story in my heart. And this is about all of you, and, and um, it's just given me a different perspective, and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say the students are continuing to work with us. We're looking now how we can continue to involve Villanova with the help of Steve and John. You know, the work continues, and I just want to again thank you all. In the back. Oh, I didn't, I didn't work on the documentary, but I want to say thank you um, to you and everyone for coming. Um, and thank you for making something positive out of this and for holding a lot of other people responsible um, because it is all of our responsibility. And just like you said, it, um, if we're not all safe, then, then what's the point? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say that you women, women have done a great job. And you should keep up the good work. My friend's been jumped at VCU many times. And that's like a city. So I definitely didn't want to go to like a city school. So I'm glad I chose like one of this community. Okay, and again, as I said, you know, we can't do it by ourselves. And we really need young people. You know, this is something that's not going to change overnight. It didn't happen overnight. But I believe that we've got more young people involved, even working with other young people. You know, young kids, 8, 9, 10 years old, that are at risk. You know, maybe you can make a difference in their lives before they get 16, 17, 18 years old and out of their anger end up picking up a gun. So again, you know, think of ways that you can become involved to make a difference. On the back. I know. Um, I just want to thank you for sharing your story again. Like Larissa and just like for your really inspiring and uh, having you serve as a family and like that. It's like when you're starting everything too, it's really made me want to do something about it and not try to that's the goal. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else in the back want to share? Okay. Uh, again, this is the I just want to say that the film, the students are working right now to get the film um, to uh, trying to get into the process for the Student Academy Awards. So they are working right now to get the application in by the deadline April 1st. The Student Academy Award, so keep your thoughts and prayers for that 
And Steve, I think you mentioned too that there were two films uh, that you kind of was kind of thinking that they may be interested in the film as well. Yeah, there's two people already interested. In festivals were already were already pre-approved to be in two festivals already. <laughs> yeah, so we're in a, one in Chicago and uh, one in LA and the Garden State. This is going to take us to. So I already sent it up and. Uh, we're already going to be in three film festivals next year, officially screened, and we'll probably submitted to uh, probably about 10 to, 10 to 15 altogether. So the film will win a bunch of awards, uh, which really isn't the point, but it's nice to be recognized for having a great film. It is a great film. Uh, John will tell you, I think of all the films we've done, I think we've, we're very personally invested in this one in a, in a deep way. And uh, but it's not going to be any good unless we can get it out and really uh, create a movement about this. That's really the goal. So hopefully, uh, and I think the, the students have been just amazing, and I think that the partnership between Bill and Mother in charge, I hope that it continues on. These things are hard to sustain. You have to really work at it to keep them together. And we will. We're committed. And you know we will. I know we will. We're committed. We're here. I'm here for the direction. Again, the book is in the back. While there may be a few sad stories or several sad stories, just know that it's the inspiration, the courage that we want you to pick up on. And we believe that this can transcend to anyone's life, the courage that the women show. Uh, through their testimonies and their stories in the book, Mothers in Charge, Face the Courage. And you can also go to our website, mothersincharge.org, to get more information about things we're doing around and how you can get involved to make a difference. Yeah, just, and just really remember that May 10th, and Donna's going to give you a little card to remind you about it. And if you're, doing, if you're not doing anything on Fridays at 6 p.m., we have a blog talk radio show, too. And it's on the back of the card. John was on your what, last week, week before last called in and, and share about the film and all of that. Thanks for the call, John. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.